So hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's workshop on the topic of divorce in college. My name is Vicki Volweiler, and I'm the founder of College Financial Prep, and I'm going to be speaking about the financial portion of applying to college. And uh, I'll let her introduce herself, uh, Eleonora. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eleanor Ferrante. I'm the owner of Square Peg Square Hole Coaching. Um, I'm the other half of Vicky, so to speak. So while she does the financial side, I handle the applications, the essays. Um, the only piece we're missing at the moment is the uh, standardized test prep, test prep. But otherwise, between the two of us, we have everything covered. <laughs> <laughs> so you may be wondering why the topic of divorce in college. You know, I know college finances is a huge thing and people have lots of questions, you know, so why are we adding divorce on top of that? Um, I guess another question I'd like to know from everybody, are you separated or divorced or widowed or, you know, something other? If you can put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, but the reason that we, we tend to do these is because divorce, as many people know, comes with its own set of complications and you put college with it, um, and while the process is mostly the same, there are definitely some nuances for divorce and certain strategies that you could take to help you save more money. So, um, and candidly, I'm a divorced mom myself. Uh, I get it. I've lived through it. Um, this is what I do. And, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about helping our kids not go into debt. And I certainly don't want us to go into debt either on our kids' educations. So, um, that's why that's why it's so important that we do this. And to tag along, while I'm not divorced, uh, many of my clients are, or their uh, the parents are widowed, and you know, and that brings its own side to the story for the kids. So, in terms of not just the financial side, but really even in terms of the application and the essays that they may choose to write, um, this sometimes it matters where we end up picking schools. Um, and how I end up working with the parents as well, right? You know, if I've got a primary, um, usually one person comes in as the primary and I'm working with them. And then it's a matter of how do you want to work together with your other half? Yeah, and, and just so you know, when you go through the divorce and college process, um, a big question that I always get, if both parents, um, if their financial information is needed, it's always kept separate. Everything is confidential. Um, what, what, what your income, your assets will never be shared with a former spouse and vice versa. You know, that, that's always a um, big, huge question. So th know that you're protected when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's really important in terms of helping the kids through this whole process. We want to make sure you feel comfortable as well, knowing that it's all you're in a safe space with us. Um, so should, should we jump right in and start talking about uh, yeah. the college process? I guess let's begin. We, we had some 10th graders. Should we start in ninth or 10th grade? Yeah, we have a lot of younger ones today. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a feel for the timeline in terms of just things to expect. And Vicki and I will be going back and forth to give you a feel for what you should be thinking about in terms of getting ready to apply, but then also the uh, financial side of it. So, you know, when I start with ninth graders and 10th graders, it's really about exploration in those years, getting a chance to try out different activities, to test the waters with some of the classes. And while I know most ninth graders have a pretty set schedule, there's not a lot of room for movement there. If you have the opportunity though, to try something new and different anytime, it's good for them. If you have a child who's really interested in the arts to give them those opportunities to take the art classes or even outside a class, if they're interested in sports to let them try a lot of things, right? It's a good chance in the early years to explore. I always want the kids to go check out the clubs and the organizations when there's a um, activities fair, um, go down there and see what's happening. You know, take advantage of anything. Um, YouTube tutorials on things they're interested in, going to your local library to see how you can do community service, right? It's about finding the things that you love, right? Because that's what ninth and 10th grade is. It's really about exploration. You know, as you start to move out of 10th grade though, then things start to shift a bit. Right? 11th grade, as many of you know, is a crazy year, right? So anybody who has a junior, I'm impressed that you're here. Right, because it's just such a busy year. The kids are running around like crazy between driver's ed for a lot of them, right? They're taking, many are taking AP classes. You're prepping for the SAT or the ACT. You're, you're oh, wait, wait, actually, 
you just brought that up. Should we just dive into a conversation about the ACTs and SATs? I'm sure everybody has tons of questions about it. Yeah, and you know, and it's interesting because that's a big topic for us these days. You know, do you even need to bother prepping for the SAT and the ACT? My yes, answer. the answer is yes. <laughs> Absolutely, Vicky and I are on the same page with this one. Right? There, there are financial reasons. There are, um, you know, re reasons that Eleanor could explain. I mean, it's just it's it's better it, it's better for the kids. The kids don't want to do it. I understand that. But um, it opens up opportunities for the kids. Um, oh, oh I, I've been with these people. Let's go to Grant now. Here, um, can you move? Can you, Got it. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. So, with taking the SATs and the ACTs, the kids, especially if they do well, um, there's the opportunity for them to receive merit scholarships or get into honors programs um, that wouldn't be available to them if they hadn't taken the test. Correct. Right. And so while there are some schools that will say that they, they are test blind. So if your kid is interested in applying to University of California schools or Cal State, those are test blind. What does that mean? It means that even if you were to send a score, they're not going to look. They don't want to know. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking at grades and your activities and your recommendations and your essays. Okay. That's really nice for the, the California schools. But most of the other schools, even if they are test optional, which means it's your choice whether you want to send or not send your score, you send a good score, they're going to look at it and it's going to make a difference because it's another data point. That being said, if your kid is not going to taking tests, it's okay. I had somebody last year, um, she had 980 and she got into an Ivy League because we didn't send the test score because she had super high grades. She was, um, she had great activities and she had what that, that school wanted, right? So not sending that test score there was a smart move. So there are times that we will send scores to some schools, but not all of them. It really depends on that particular school because I'm trying to help the kids get in obviously, but also to get the merit aid that they are um, and the honors programs that they are eligible for. So what, what Eleanor is saying that, you know, we're, we both tie in together, the, the roles that we play in the college process, um, there's a lot of strategy that's involved in, in the planning and preparing, both on the admission side and the financial side. You know, as far as um, divorce goes, you know, or widowhood, you know, it's important to consider the, the family dynamics and the finances and you know, using using what could be perceived as your strengths and where to apply to help you save the most money. So it, and same thing is true on the admission side. Uh, you know, somebody with a 980 getting into an Ivy League school, you know, that's that's fantastic. All right. Flip side though, this year I had a student with a 1500. So 1500 out of a 1600 is very good on the SAT. And she got deferred from Northeastern. I had an equivalent student who got in and we'll, she's like, what else could I have done? She's in the top, you know, 10, not 10%, top 10 of her class. She has started her own clubs. She's got just an amazing person. But for whatever reason, they didn't need her. So even though we sent a 1500 there, they didn't, you know, that wasn't enough. And like her grades and everything. So it's really, it, there was a lot of strategy behind it, um, you know, I had a kid this year that had a 1400 and change and we didn't send it to a number of his schools because it was too low. It's so crazy, so crazy. But we sent them to the others where it made sense. Um, I see there's a question about, do you think SATs will continue to be optional after COVID? Yes, I definitely think they will continue to be optional. That I don't know if everybody saw it. I was gonna mention about how the SATs are changing. So for anybody who has a freshman or younger, the SAT will be digital, we think. Um, by the time your freshman or younger gets up to the um, to the point of taking the SAT, it will be an hour shorter. It will yeah, be two online. hours instead of three hours. Calculators, calculators, yep, available for the whole thing. Um, and what's interesting is that it will change on the fly. So the SAT that I get may not be the same SAT that Vicky gets, depending on how we answer some of the questions. So it will be um, a moving target, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, remember the the SAT, you know, it, it's a business. So they want the kids, even test optional, 
they, they still want the kids to take the tests and to pay for the tests and to submit them to the schools wherever they're going to submit them to. Um, and hopefully the, you know, they're hoping that the kids will do well and keep on taking the tests and then you'll have the option about whether to, to send them. So by making these changes, which seem like they're very consumer friendly changes, um, they're hoping that people will be still drawn to them. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that the ACT has also been talking for a while about going test optional, um, sorry, about going digital. Um, so we're all curious to see now they have, ACT does the, um, they offer the test uh, digitally in other state, in other countries. So I'm curious to see at what point it actually makes its way here. Um, and, you know, everybody will then be um, doing everything digitally. So one thing to keep in mind too with it, while many of the schools have gone test optional, not all of them have. Um, so if you are looking to apply to the, the Florida universities, the um, Georgia universities, they're requiring them. Um, if you've got a kid who's looking at Georgetown, they're requiring them. So um, not everybody's test optional. Hey, Vicki, I see a question for you that, uh, that definitely ties into the financial side. If someone wants to go to a certain college and they're not getting enough money from that college, should they be emailing and seeing if they could get more money? Ah, the old appeal question. So this is a typical 12th grade issue. Um, so, I mean, just setting it up, the, the child has already applied to colleges, assuming that they've already gotten in, they've already received their financial aid award letter, and then maybe they weren't offered enough money. So I, I'm just gonna make up an example. You know, maybe the school costs $75,000 a year and they were awarded, you know, a $20,000 grant, bringing it down, the cost down to 55,000. But maybe the family still can't afford that um, or doesn't wanna pay it, um, you know, looking for a better deal. Um, the answer is always no, unless you ask. So yeah, you can ask. Um, I mean, schools are businesses. They wanna fill their seats. You know, the worst that they can do is say no. Um, you know, when, when, if you're going to do that, you know, certainly don't demand more money, um, build a case as to why, you know, you believe that you should have more money. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, it, it, it doesn't hurt to ask. They will not rescind your, you know, your acceptance. Right. You know, and to that point, there are um, buyers and sellers in terms of colleges, right? Because they are a business. And what we've seen the last couple, last year or two, you know, enrollment has gone down in a number of schools. So they're trying harder. Those, some of those schools are trying harder to get the students. And so they're more willing to give money and discount the price. So I just posted actually, um, actually I'll, I'll mention this. I just posted on my social media page. So for whoever wants it um, on Facebook, it's facebook.com at, you know, facebook.com slash college financial prep. And you'll find there, I literally just posted, there was an article that I saw yesterday from Yahoo where they were talking about how for next year that due to increasing inflation and um, excuse me, you know, labor shortages and whatnot that they're gonna have to start raising tuition and fees and room and board. Um, and one school reference, they were talking about how they're gonna be raising it two years in a row. Now it made me think because all of these colleges you know, due to COVID, due to whatever reasons, numbers in the whole are down at many of the colleges and their businesses, they want to fill seats. So they're going to be raising their fees and which they may in turn have more seats to fill because people won't want to pay to go there. So I'm wondering on the flip side, are they going to be giving out larger merit scholarships? I mean, it's just going to be interesting to see what happens, but you know, to the question of, should I ask for more money? Yeah, ask for more money because many of the schools have have those seats to fill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, you, know, you have to be careful. One of the things um, I learned this trick from Vicky because I had one of my students send me an email yesterday with a picture of her um, financial aid package, but it really wasn't a financial aid package. She was being given an unsubsidized loan. She's like, what do you <laughs> think? I'm like, well, let me explain to you what that is. So maybe Vicky, you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, okay, so. When, when the kids apply to schools, um, they send in their 12th grade senior year, they send in their applications, they send in their test scores, and then you also send in the financial aid applications. And 
Um, there's FAFSA. There's some schools require what's called the CSS profile. Um, some schools require their own institutional aid forms. Every single school requires FAFSA. So let's just talk about FAFSA right now. Anyway, um, the child, the family submits all of those different pieces. And then come the spring, after the child has already received their acceptances in the main, they'll receive a financial aid award letter from each school, which will detail what it costs to attend that school in terms of tuition fees, room and board, uh, an estimate for books and personal expenses, and it'll also provide you with the number that you're getting in free money, scholarships and grants. And then we'll also tell the, the student if they've been awarded any work study and, and how much they've been awarded in student loans. Student loans is not free money. You want free money. Student loans, you may not have to pay it right then, but you still have to pay it back. So uh, talking about that, um, freshman year, the students are able to get in student loans on their own up to $5,500 um, in, in student loan money from the federal government. That can be comprised of subsidized loans and unsubsidized loans. Subsidized loans, there's no interest accruing on them while the child is in college. And that's on a need-based only basis. You can earn a million dollars a year and qualify for the maximum $5,500 in unsubsidized loans. I mean, you can, you know, there, there's no, um, there, there's no need-based component to the $5,500 in unsubsidized. Anyone can qualify for that. But to but interest is going to start as soon as you accept the money freshman year. Um, it, so it's those subsidized loans that are need-based. Um, but yeah, when it when it comes time to look at those financial award letters, you know, just keep in mind, even though the schools call loans financial aid, they still need to be paid back. Yeah, it was quite eye-opening for my student as I explained that to her yesterday. <laughs> well, I, I usually always do a financial literacy lesson with you know, the parent and the child, and we'll be talking about how much the cost of college is, you know, different types of colleges that they're considering, and what that might look like after four years, and how much potential loans there would be for both the student and the parents, because really $5,500 freshman year, the student can't afford the cost of college on their own. Um, so really it's going to affect everybody in the future. It affects the parents' retirement accounts. It affects the, the children being able to you know, start their own lives. Um, they, they may be encumbered by all this debt. So to, just food for thought. You know, that's why I'm always working with parents to try to, uh, I mean, seriously, to minimize the cost of college. I, I know how awful it could be. Right. So in terms of some of that, then, like to go back to the timeline a little bit, as you look as um, for juniors, right, as they're starting to hone in on their activities, the things that they really love, you know, those are the things that potentially can offer you opportunity for some merit aid, right? If you, um, I see the question here, what colleges are better for a band student? What should we look for? Right? So music is definitely a space that um, some schools will give merit aid for. They're looking for um, kids for their marching band, for their symphonic, their uh, performing arts. Um, I had a student, um, Sac Sacred Heart, threw them like an extra 10 grand if they wanted to be on kick line. Right, just because, right? They were looking for, they saw that on her application, they really wanted her to come there. She ended up not going. It wasn't the space, place that she wanted at the end. But, you know, there is that piece to it. Um, so it's important to start thinking about, you know, depth of involvement. You don't need 20 activities, right? You shouldn't be overloading the, the kids, honing in on the things that really they love and they want to do, because that's the space that, first of all, they'll get to see what they're interested in. It will give them an outlet from school because junior year is so crazy. Um, and it also gives you a, pop, a chance for some um, opportunity for merit aid, right? Um, because you know, junior year, you've got, you're working really hard towards your grades because a rigorous course load is important, as rigorous as makes sense for your kid. So that might mean all APs, it might mean honors, it might mean regents, it, it's, or some mix thereof. It's what makes sense for your kid. Um, but, and it's also thinking about making sure they, co they continue to take all the major subjects all the way through. So even though New York State Diploma says you don't need to, 
many colleges want you to, right? So it's just paying attention to those things to make you the most valuable um, applicant for these schools. So specifically when I'm looking at band students and working with them, the key to band students is what's your instrument? Same thing holds true in terms of, it's just like a sport, right? Or um, if you're a dancer or you play the violin. So some, you wanna find a school that is good for your instrument and has professors there that you like and get a lot, you know, that would you wanna take lessons from, that you have a good rapport with. So tuba, all right. So my friend was the littlest tuba at BC. Um, right, so when you're looking for brass, right? So I tend to work with, um, I've had trombones, I've had French horns, I haven't had a tuba yet that's gone in. Um, but I always tell them you want to reach out to the schools and the band teachers a lot of times can help them with this. You want to reach out to the school, say, this is the instrument I play. You want to connect with the professors there. When you go visit the schools, you want to try and meet with those professors, take a lesson with them because those professors sometimes have some in for the application process and can talk to admissions be like, I need the littlest tuba this year. I have to have them, right? And so, and that could help get your kid into that school and potentially that could give you some money. Um, sometimes it doesn't do anything for you, um, but I will say this. So Maryland has a pretty good brass section and so does Penn State. So just two schools off the top of my head, that's a little nugget on that. Um, but junior year, you also take the PSAT. And while not a lot of people will score high enough with the PSAT to do anything with that. The kids who score at the top end of the PSAT are eligible for what's called the National Merit Scholarship. Um, and there are various forms of that. There's the National Hispanic version, there's the general version. Um, I've had a couple of kids who, because they scored so well on the PSAT, receive those awards um, and it's tied, you can get money for them at some of the schools. So there's a whole process with that. So don't discount any of the testing. Right, there, there's potential for it no matter what. Um, anything else I'm missing junior year, Vicki, in terms of the financial side? Junior year, it's a lot of um, self-awareness when it comes to finances. I think junior year is an extremely important time to start taking inventory, thinking about, you know, first of all, I get it. We started to talk earlier. This is about divorce and college. You know, life happens, you know. I'm sure in the main, most of us were not able to save up, you know, exactly what we wanted to for our kids' education. I mean, that's uh, that's not even divorce. That's just everybody. But but yes, uh, you know, life happens. Anyway, what's so important is to think about how much you have saved. You know, maybe you have 529 plans for the kids. Um, what can you contribute each year that they're in college? How many kids do you have that you have to plan for college for? You know, and start thinking about all those hard questions. And then maybe, um, you know, will grandparents help pay with college? Do you have employers that will, you know, also contribute to the tuition for your children? You know, what, what resources are available? You know, then, you know, we can start thinking about what your projected EFC is going to look like. Um, EFC stands for Expected Family Contribution. And when you go senior year, senior year, when we're filling out FAFSA, it spits out an EFC, expected family contribution. And that's a number that the colleges use to determine what the government thinks that you can afford to pay for college that year. Now, no, no uh, two colleges uses that EFC formula the same. You know, if, if your EFC comes out, and of course, I'm just making this up, if your EFC comes out saying, that you can afford to pay $20,000 per year. I'm not making this up here. I'll give you two examples. School A costs $70,000 a year, but they fully 100% commit to meeting a student's need. So $70,000 a year, you can afford to pay 20. The difference is 50, they're gonna give you a grant of $50,000. School B though, may only meet 50% of a student's need. So the EFC, you can afford to pay $20,000. School B costs $70,000 too. There's that $50,000 difference. But because they're only meeting 50% of your need, the $50,000, they're only going to give you $25,000. So now you're expected to pay 20 plus an additional 25. So that's $45,000. 
So it's important to, um, you know, what I always do with clients is we forecast this EFC and then we're looking at the various colleges and how it's all gonna play together in helping to develop that, that college list. So Eleonora and I work together a lot because she helps find the colleges, you know, that are gonna be academically and socially on target for your child, but I'm working with you to look at the finances and making sure it's a good fit all around. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an important exercise junior year before, it, you know, the best way to save money on the cost of college is to plan ahead. And that's what happens, you know, junior year. You know, and the piece to that too is you want to be done in four years or less, right? So I have a lot of students who will take um, college credit in high school. They will take AP classes. And depending on the school, some of those colleges will let you finish up sooner. So I have one student, she is finishing her art history degree in three years. She will then take on her master's and the year after that. So that instead of spending four years on of undergraduate tuition, she's only spending three, huge savings, right? I have another student who is down at University of Florida and they have this great business program. So once you're there and in, you can apply in and you can get your master's as well as your undergrad in the four years. So again, a huge cost savings, right? For anybody who's gone on to take an MBA, it's two years full-time, right? And it's forever part-time. I know it took me five years at night to, to get mine. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind is those programs where they have the combined programs, you can do them in a short amount of time. The schools, the SUNYs and the public schools will allow you a lot of times to put credit so that you take fewer classes. Some For everyone here who's not from New York, SUNY is State University of New York. It's our public school system, public college system. Right. So if you have a school, like a lot of the private schools, while they may give you credit for taking those APs, they still want you to take 120 credits of there. So you have to pay for four years of schooling, right? So it's more pieces to think about in terms of the financial. So for me, that's where the academic piece comes in, right? How can I help you find schools where you are a great academic fit and potentially can get done a little quicker? Um, yeah, so Vicki, I see the question, um, does the EFC take into account the fact that there are multiple kids um, in a family? Wait, say that again? I didn't see. Uh, does the EFC take into account having multiple kids in oh. college at the same time? I have four kids only two years apart. And the answer is yes. Okay, so the answer is right now, yes, it takes into account having multiple kids in college at the same time. However, there is, if you've heard of, and I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called the FAFSA Simplification Act, which is not very simple. It's actually making things much more complicated, especially if you're divorced. Um, it's not even 100% a given. It was supposed to go into effect for this year, and it didn't because so many people complained. Um, it may go into effect next year. And when it does go into effect, it includes the provision that they take away the considering the amount of kids in college at the same time, which it doesn't even just impact divorced parents. That impacts everybody that has multiple kids in college at the same time. It's awful. And that's why there's been such pushback. So I, I'm not certain. I don't know if anybody's certain about what's happening with it. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, that's one of the things, um, as long as I'm bringing up the FAFSA Simplification Act, I'll share with you also the part that impacts, um, separated and divorced families specifically. Right now, um, schools that require FAFSA, the, uh, how do I phrase this? Um, there are certain schools that require only one parent's information. Um, it's, it's not even cut and dry with the CSS profile. I just need to leave it. I can't tell you offhand exactly which schools, um, but there are certain schools that will only require one parent's information. I certainly recommend if you're divorced, you know, in the main, of course, it's going to depend on your individual situation, but in the main, you know, that's, that's where we tend to focus. Um, it also depends on who the custodial parent is and, and whatnot, but yes, only one person would be, um, putting together that EFC if your child is only applying to schools that will require that one parent. But there's a lot of strategy planning that goes into that too. Um, 
you know, in terms of who the custodial parent is and whatnot. Oh, and so the FAFSA Simplification Act, it was going to remove who the custodial parent is as the person that fills out the FAFSA form. And it's going to become the person that provides the most financial support for the child. Now, it's possible that even if one parent provides more in child support, it is possible to, you know, make a case about the other parent providing more in support. But again, there hasn't been enough guidelines uh, delivered around this. So yeah, I'm keeping my eyes on it. And, you know, we'll certainly have a plan when it comes out, you know, because, because I want to help everybody save money. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that answers that question is if we're divorced, does each parent have an EFC? Um, not exactly. Um, you know, it goes back to, it depends on the schools that the child applies to. Um, EFC is derived from FAFSA, which is typically just one parent, but it depends on the situation. So don't just assume it's one parent. You know, I, I don't know each of your, you know, own, own situation, go, you know, that's going on. So, um, you know, that, that's for a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but sometimes some schools will require the information of both parents, which is why I said earlier that, you know, everything is kept confidential from the other parent. Um, so yes, sometimes the information is needed from both parents. And it's possible if either or both parents are remarried, that they're going to take a look at, you know, it's possible to have four parents information, um, financial information be considered for one child. So, uh, you know, it, it all goes back into planning strategically before you develop that college list. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so in terms then in, of developing the college list, right? So as you're a junior, that's a great time to be thinking about that and looking for the schools that have the majors that your student wants, that has the activities, that has the location, um, you know, and creating a as list. The <laughs> and the grades, right? Like, what are all the things that are important to you? And creating a list of those criteria. Um, you know, some kids have, you think about the emotional side of it, the social side of it, right? Where are you going to feel comfortable? Are you a student who likes to be at the top of their class, wants to be a big fish in a small pond? Or are you the kind of student who does better in a big lecture space where you can just listen and then go off to a smaller section afterwards to talk about what you learned in class? There's a lot of considerations that go into like building the list. Um, you also wanna think about the, what kind of support your child might need when they get there, right? So do they have an IEP, a 504 plan? Like what are the things that they might need when they get there? So there's a lot of different aspects that go into it. Um, but it, it's when you're looking at the school and trying to, you wanna factor in not just the costs that you see online in terms of tuition and the fees and the room and the board and all that as Vicki goes through, but knowing your kid, are they gonna to wanna to come home a lot? And where are they, right? So my son went to school in Boston. We live on Long Island. That's a drive home. You can hop on a plane, you can hop on a train. It's pretty easy. But my cousin's kid who's in Louisiana, well, you know, he's not coming home very often because it's just really expensive. So, you know, taking into account some of those ancillary pieces that you, the schools aren't necessarily going to put in front of you, right? And so what do you have to remember and keep, and keep track of? Um, then as you're hitting, and it's a great time to be visiting colleges if possible. And I always say you can visit local schools. If you visit Penn State, just picture it when it's really hot and you get a feel for Clemson. Right, you know, it's a different school. A lot more blondes at Clemson than there are at, uh, at Penn State, but you get a lot of the similar kind of feels. So, depending on where you live, you have plenty of opportunity to go visit schools near you and start to get an idea of what you like, what fits you. Um, where does your child feel most comfortable? You know, when my kids were younger, when we would go on vacation, I would drive through college campuses, right, just so they could have a feel that this is what it looked like. Sometimes because we went in, we ate there, right? Sometimes you can get really good food on some of these campuses. Highly recommend UMass, just FYI, right? But, you know, getting a feel for the schools and starting to feel that out so that as you're hitting the summer before senior year, you're working on your essay, you're working on um, starting to work on the applications, filling all of that out, 
because it would be really ideal, and I try and do this with the students I work with, that by the time summer is over, that we've got the bulk of their applications ready and at least you know in place. And that because so many schools take the Common App right now, so that's one of the types, one of the um, application platforms. So if you don't know where your kid is going to apply, you can still have them start filling that out over the summer. So it takes down a little bit of the stress, right? And they start getting things in place, writing their essay. They're going to need it for every school. So starting to get those things in place so that they're not so stressed out about it and feel a little bit more comfortable, right? Because- Here's the other reason. <laughs> I'm just going to talk about my, my own personal experience with this. If they get it done during the summer or get it done by Labor Day or something, they are- I mean, talking about the stress relief, they're in the middle of like all these AP classes, 12th grade, they have a million things going on with clubs and extracurriculars and, and homework, and it's just one less piece. As much as you can, get it done sooner. <laughs> yeah. uh, so my best story on that, I actually two stories in that. Last year, I had uh, two girls, they were at a Halloween um, Halloween party, and they were saying to their friends, or you know, like, this is great. We should, you know, I'm so happy to be out, blah, blah. And their friends like, oh, we have to go home. I'm like, why do you have to go home? We have to work on our applications. And my two were done. So they're like, we don't have to go home because <laughs> we're all <laughs> finished. I, and I had a kid this year that um, he got injured and he had to have surgery and all sorts of crazy stuff happened because um, he's a soccer player. He needed, he was out of commission for two weeks, but he was so far ahead in the process, getting everything done. There was no added stress, right? And I was like, Go do what you need to. I'll see you in a couple of weeks when you're feeling better and moving on. Right? Because senior year, Vicki's right, you have all, there's so much for the kids to be doing and getting their applications in, but then you have a lot to do also because that's the time when it's time for the, the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Right? Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, so come October. Yeah, October 1st is the big date. Um, it's definitely important. Um, at, at that point, hopefully, you know, where your, your kid's applying to schools, um, you know, you, you're, you're considering finances when developing that college list, and yeah, then it's time to jump into FAFSA and CSS profile. I, I think I saw that there was a question in the chat. There is. Um, How do you find out if a school only requires the FAFSA for one parent? Um, I mean, seriously, there's no... FAFSA list. I mean, each each college has their own, you know, website, and you can always go to the financial aid pages, and they'll say what they need. Um, you know, depending on the state, you know, New York also has um, state financial aid applications. Um, Pennsylvania has state applications. You know, but it's on a state by state basis. So yeah, you're you're best off looking at the the schools. Um, websites to determine. You know, I mean, you know, or we could work together. But you know, if you're doing it on your own. Um, th that would be my best suggestion. Right. And, you know, the, the financial aid stuff opens up in October for both the forms. Um, I always like to get applications in earlier because the pool of money is bigger up front. Yeah. Right? So what I like to tell people, imagine that like each school has a big pot of money and the longer you wait to submit applications, that pot starts to get smaller and smaller. Um, so it's important to do it early. Um, another thing. You know, a lot of times people will say to me, oh, I'm not going to qualify for financial aid. Why should I do it? Um, you know, why should I fill out the applications? Well, one, some of the schools that give out merit money require to have a financial aid form on file. I mean, I know that's true. You know, it's true for my son. It's true for other people. Um, another reason, if your child wants to uh, apply for work study programs, and again, it's a need-based program, but if you want to apply, it's done through the FAFSA application. Mm -hmm. Regardless of your income, if you're gonna need student loans, that $5,500 that I mentioned freshman year and it's $6,500 sophomore year and $7,500 for each year, junior and senior year, um, that comes with the lowest interest rate. It doesn't need a cosigner, but again, the child has to complete FAFSA to, to, to get that student loan. Last reason for everybody to complete FAFSA I like to compare it to an insurance policy. You know, I hope nobody ever gets hit by a bus, but you know, in that unlikely horrific event, you know, if something horrible happens in the family, it's possible to go back to the school and ask if they can review, you know, the, the new 
financial situation in the household and possibly reduce the cost. So it's much easier to do that when the uh, FAFSA form is already on file as opposed to having to wait another year. So yeah, lots of very important reasons for everybody to make sure that they fill out those financial aid forms. Right, and get them done. All right, so once you've gotten those in, so that's the fall of senior year, you've um, written whatever supplemental essays the schools may require. You've taken all the tests that you feel that you're going to take and submitting them. Right? So there's a couple of different deadlines. So a lot of the schools have what's called an early action deadline that um, typically if you're a southern school, it's October. If you're a northern school, it's November. Um, early action is non-binding. So I really like it a lot because it tells the school you're interested. You've gotten your application in and done. And then you don't have to, de to decide until April, right? So May 1st is the deadline for students to tell the schools. And if it's early action, even though they tell you early, if you've gotten accepted, you don't have to decide if that's your school or not. That's a big difference from early decision schools. Early decisions, you are Don't binding. do it. Don't do it. <laughs> right. It's a binding commitment to that school. It says, if you accept me, then I'm coming. So and a coming of regardless of finances. <laughs> So, and what people get caught up on in this is if you start to look at the numbers that, especially this year, a lot of schools have been filling a good portion of their classes through early decision, but it makes sense because back to what Vicki said, colleges are a business. They want to guarantee that somebody's going to fill that seat. So if they know that you have to say yes, once they accept you, well, you're- there's, there's no negotiating. There's no asking for more money. Um, right. there's no change, you know, you, you can't, it, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you're not supposed to change your mind. You know, you're, you're committed. It, it's, you know, they say it's, they say it's a binding contract, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let you address that, but, um, and it, and it is, I mean, occasionally I've heard of people being get able to get out of it, but they're unicorns, right? It's, they're few and far between. And so I always tell my students, you know, you have to be 100% sure that not only is this your absolute best school for you, it fits you best academically, socially, emotionally, but that you can hand over $300,000 if it's a you know, private school. You know what, can I talk about that for a second? Um, so what I wanna say is that, you know, every, every child, every student, every person, you know, has a different intended career path. And it depends, I suppose, or, or definitely, you know, what that child's intentions are. Um, if a student is intending to go into teaching or social work, and they're likely to work in the same exact hospital or the same exact public school, no matter what college they go to, no matter how much they pay for that education, and they're going to, you know, take the same licensing exams and, you know, ultimately have the same level of income, you know, you have to think about, is it worth spending that extra money? You know, uh, on the flip side, you know, maybe that child really does have a specific career path that, you know, spending $300,000, you know, is ultimately worth it, um, you know, because the return on that investment will be so great. But, you know, that's one thing I, I never, ever, ever tell clients what school they should go to. I want to make sure that they are informed and that you make appropriate decisions for your family. But this is definitely one of those considerations where you have to think about: is it worth it or not? Um, so you know, it's important to discuss with your child what their what their intentions are. Right, and you know, and I've worked with students who have gotten to um, you know, a, I'll call it a tier two school. Right, it's a good school. They did great there. They came out with a 4.0 and change and they got involved with the right activities and they did research with professors and professors really got to know them. They had great recommendations. And I, I know one student that she came out of a school that many of you may not have even heard of. She got into every Ivy and Stanford for her graduate work in organic chemistry and finished her postdoc at Harvard. She spent nothing to go to college because she went to a local public school in her state, right? She's the favorite child in her parents' house, right? <laughs> you know, you can't beat that. So, right, so those are all things that, you know, to take into consideration. So, so you've got 
you apply as early as possible or EA, not ED, right? Early action, preferably. There's also then regular decision, which, you know, for anybody who's in my age range or so, um, that's pretty much all there was when we applied. And that's typically around January. Sometimes it's later. I have some schools that my kids are applying to that um, it's March, it's April, it's actually July. Um, some of them it's, at, it's earlier. Some of the Florida schools, it's November, right? But so regular decision though is, you apply, there's no binding to it, right? You're part of the general pool and they will let you know by April 1st whether or not you've gotten in. And so, you know, and then what happens is you start to receive all the acceptances and you've got to kind of go through them and as best you can figure apples to apples because it's really hard sometimes to be able to see the difference in those financial aid packages. How much do they really want your child and what are they willing to give you for them? You know, and sometimes you get lucky and initial package is really good, right? I've seen that in some of the schools where um, I had, uh, oh God, I guess I had like four or five kids apply to University of Miami this year. My one with the lowest test scores and grades was the only one that got in. The others were deferred, <laughs> right? So now you gotta go, well, what happened there? How could that possibly be? Well, the answer is, that the other ones were going for business, psychology, um, international relations, right? So very um, uh, tough, major, yeah, very popular majors. Uh, my other student on the other hand was going for a theater major, stage management specifically, and they needed stage management majors because they don't have any, um, they don't have any sophomores or uh, freshmen stage management majors. So they're all aging out. He got 30 grand a year. Fabulous. Wow. Right? Right? We're like, what the heck? And so, you know, there's all these aspects to it that you have to take into consideration, right? You know, majors do play a role. And I'm not suggesting that you pick stage management just to get into a school because that's not how it works. Okay. Because you have to audition, have a portfolio, and do all of that. And it's a lot harder to get in a lot of schools for stage management, right? But it is something to um to think about. Like, is there a school where so some of the other schools where he applied to stage management, they didn't need them. So he did not get in and he did not get money, right? So those are some of the other aspects to it. You know, if your kid is, um, you know, is a quarterback, but that school's got three quarterbacks lined up, well, they're not going to give you money for him to show up unless all of a sudden he is, you know, the next Tom Brady. So. Here, let me just jump in and say this. When you are planning for college and discussing everything with your child, you know, and their career path, think about if your child is likely also going to want or need to go to graduate school. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is because of the finances. You know, me personally, I'd rather see somebody go to a um, less expensive, less known undergraduate program and save the money for graduate school if that's the way it needs to be. Um, you know, so, so just food for thought as, as you're planning, you know, also it could certainly, you know, we were talking about student loans and it all adding up, you know, especially on the graduate school level. So, you know, just something else to keep in mind. Yep. Um, so there's a question, do you have to declare a major during the application process? And the answer is it depends. So, um, there are plenty of schools where you can go in undeclared. Sometimes you have to go in undeclared business, undeclared liberal arts, undeclared health sciences. And sometimes you can just go plain and simple undeclared. And I have a ton of schools that are great exploratory schools. You don't know what you want yet. You can go to these schools and you can still get out in four years with the degree that makes sense for you. Um, that being said, yeah, sometimes you, you should apply with a major because one, if you know what you want, um, sometimes some of the schools will look at you. If you go in undeclared, they will assume that you may end up in one of their most um, uh, restrictive majors and tough to get in ones. And so they will review your application against those kids, right? And, you're, and you might want something totally different that doesn't have those same kind of criteria surrounding it, right? So if you have a feel for it, Yes. And it's also helpful if you have a sense of the major, at least I don't necessarily need you to know if you want accounting or you want to be finance, but if you know you want business. So we make sure that the school you go to has a business school, right? I had a kid a couple of years ago. She really wanted to go to the University of um, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, but the major she wanted, they didn't have. I was like, you know, that major's not here. 
you might look really good in light blue, but that's not going <laughs> to, you can't go to this school for that, right? So um, things to consider. I saw a little further back. So once you have decided on a school and you put down the deposit, um, somebody was asking the question, how much in general is a deposit? It's usually about $500. I don't know. Well, if let let me say this about deposits, because I always get this question, or mm -hmm. I always hear about it after the fact. Do, you, do not rush to put down a deposit. It takes away any, you know, if you're gonna ask for more money, ask before you put a deposit down. Once you put the deposit down, they have no reason to give you more money. They know that you wanna go there. So no, no need to rush in my opinion. I, in my opinion as well. And I also say, look, you're talking about 16, 17 year olds. They change their minds, you know, 30 times in a day about what to have for lunch. So, you know, give them as much time as possible to decide on the place that makes the most sense. Um, and the question about, is there any kind of discount that goes with that if you're widowed? I have never seen one because it's a deposit on the cost of attending that school. So Vicki, have you ever seen anybody discount the, no, right? No. Okay, um, question about, my son is interested in neurology. He could go the pre-med route or psychology, which would be, it would be better to do psychology as it isn't as difficult to major. The answer is that if you're going to go to med school, you could major in business, you can major in engineering, you can major in psychology, anything you want, as long as you take all of the prereqs that you need for medical school. So your major is not what the driving force is there. And obviously, if you are a biology major, then you're going to be checking off a lot of those boxes for your major. Versus if you're a business major, it's going to be a little harder to get in all the prereqs, right? So it's not so much um, the major as the coursework that you take, right? So that's something to consider if you want to be a veterinarian, if you want to be um, any kind of medical doctor, it's like, what will you need to get into those schools later? Uh, Vicki, how early can you start negotiating if you apply early action and start to get accepted? Well, you start to get accepted and you may learn what your merit scholarship is, but you won't see your whole financial award package typically to like March. So not till after you see the whole package. You know, and the package will include, you know, need-based aid, merit scholarships, you know, will include all of it. So yeah, well, you, you should wait till then. Yeah, I, I know a lot of my kids get all excited because they, they get their letter and then they don't have a financial aid package. You're like, what happened? I'm like, well, because they come separately. <laughs> it's not all <laughs> together. Right? And sometimes what you'll get is um, you might get like a presidential award with your acceptance letter, but that's not your full package. Right. Necessarily. All right. So Vicki, I know we're coming up on eight o'clock. So trying to be cognizant of everybody's time. Any final thoughts that you want to make sure you pass along to this group? Final thoughts. Um, okay. Final thoughts. I hope I hope everybody can appreciate this, especially when it comes to divorce and divorce in college. Communication. I know it's a topic we all don't like. Um, however, when it comes to our kids, it's important that we certainly communicate with our kids and communicate with our exes for the benefit of our kids. Um, and it is difficult as anything. I've lived through it myself. Um, but it's so important to try to get on the same page, especially with your kids early on. There are too many families that can't talk about the finances. And then come April, and really this goes for married or divorced. I, I have married friends that this happened to. Um, they never spoke about what was doable financially. And the the child only had their heart set on a certain school and mom and dad just couldn't do it and bedlam breaks out and you know there's crying there's stress there's this there's that set a goal early on work work towards that common goal with your child make sure you're on the same page that way they'll be you know everyone will be much happier in the end yeah. and my parting words kind of tie into that there's 4,000 or so colleges and universities in the United States. There are plenty of schools that make sense. And what's on the t-shirt is less important than what's in the t-shirt, right? So the school that's best for your child is the school that has the academic program that they want, where they will succeed academically, where they'll succeed socially, where they will be comfortable and engaged 
and really want to participate and get the most they can out of those years. And there are plenty of schools that will check all those boxes as well as the financial box for them. So they just need to think a little broader. They need to understand this is four years of your life. It's not your entire life. You are not buying a house. It is not that kind. It's, it's a play. There are plenty of options. You just have to be open to them. And that's what Vicki and I do. We help you figure out what those options are so that they make sense. Your kid has the best possible list come April and they're happy because they have great choices that make sense and check their boxes. Perfect. And with that, we are coming up on eight. <laughs> Uh, um, everyone will um, we'll be in touch. We'll, we'll send you a copy of the recording. Um, we'll also send you a timeline that both Eleanor and I have prepared together. So it'll cover both the, the admission side and the financial side. So you can keep track of um, you know, what, what you should be thinking about and when. And if you want, you know, feel free to get in touch with us. Yep. So I'm just throwing my website in. And Vicki, if you want to do that too in the uh, chat so that um, you can contact me through mine. You can see all my resources. My blogs are all there. Vicki's got the same thing on hers. So by all means, um, you know, reach out to us if you have any further questions. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll stop the recording. Where is it to stop? <laughs>